So, uh, uh, as we've been introduced, uh, behind every uh, ERAS enthusiast, there's an enthusiast, and I've been introducing Andrew from uh, Edinburgh in Scotland, who, in fact, uh, not only runs the uh, programme, but also calls uh, it the database. So, here's the real living proof of a functional ERAS programme. Hugh Patterson present uh, our consecutive sees of a thousand patients in the database, so it can be done, and uh, you've met the team that uh, uh, are doing it. So, uh, as we come towards the end of the conference, I think it is very important to uh, consider the uh, patient, and that the patient is the centre of our focus. So we, we wondered about uh, trying to get a patient to come along to speak about uh, his or her experience, but uh, th this is going to be a bit difficult on this occasion. So what we've done is we've interviewed a patient, uh, Angie actually interviewed the patient, and uh, we're going to uh, speak together about uh, what uh, this patient's view actually was. Okie doke. So th this is the patient uh, that uh, volunteered to, to be interviewed, and he was a very interesting uh, gentleman, a 55-year-old man, normally fit and well, and very literate and very forthcoming, able to give you all his views. And uh, certainly, you know, it, when you're sitting at the outpatient clinic and you're seeing the next patient and you read the letter from the general practitioner and it says, you know, university lecturer and senior partner in a law firm, you certainly think, gosh, we're better to have no complications here. <laughs> so it was with some trepidation that uh, our uh, patient came along, and uh, he had no uh, past medical history of particular note. Um, he was graded ASA 2, but he had a, a fairly formidable uh, well-fed, legal abdomen. <laughs> now, in Scotland, we have um, uh, introduced a, a national colorectal cancer screening program over the last two or three years, and this has been running very successfully. Except, in terms of you know what we've been doing about ERAS, it uh, really has stressed our system because all these cancer patients who are out in their community undiagnosed through the screening program have now popped up into the system two or three years ahead of when they would usually have presented for diagnosis and treatment. So our system has actually become overloaded uh, with uh, colorectal cancer patients. And so it's against that efficiency background that we heard in the last talk that we are actually having to work. We're having to work more and more efficiently to actually just keep up with the increasing demand for services with the introduction of a national uh, colorectal cancer screening program. So that's another side of the coin for uh, why efficiency is so important and why uh, enhanced recovery has allowed us to keep our heads just above water. Now, the, the screen program had picked up this chap uh, had uh, blood in his bowel motion, so he went along for his colonoscopy, and this uh, revealed that he had a hepatic flexure carcinoma. And I planned rather kind of uh, bravado, I'm only in my second year of doing laparoscopic colorectal surgery. I used to do laparoscopic surgery when I was a trainee and then gave it up uh, for many years just concentrating in open surgery. But my anaesthetist put her head over the blood-brain barrier two years ago and said, Ken, I cannot believe you are pushing enhanced recovery after surgery and you do not do laparoscopic surgery. 
So there is a good example of the blood-brain barrier working well. And with that one big push, Firon set off for retraining. And as I mentioned earlier in this conference, um, suddenly he has, from being an uphill struggle with open surgery, it's like water running down a hill. It's so easy with uh, laparoscopic surgery. But laparoscopic surgery in itself is not that easy, and it takes uh, quite a time to learn and become skilled in it. But I, I, that, so, so I planned with some trepidation, I must say, that in this lawyer, for no complications, I was going to undertake a laparoscopic procedure with his BMI substantially over 30. Anyway, uh, we planned for this, uh, but as, as it happened, I couldn't get good access to the panty plate to get this out, so we had to convert to an open right hand plate. Me. He was in hospital for about five days, and uh, as you know, you see, if you convert from a laparoscopic to an open operation, these are the patients that just take a bit longer, and uh, he developed a chest infection. But we coped with that, and it's interesting, and Angie's going to uh, discuss this, even, even though he was such a, a competent individual and so well uh, in control of himself and his ability to talk about his illness and so on, there was this underlying anxiety that he had. Next slide. So, uh, well, this is the outcome of the interview that we had after he had recovered from his ERAS experience. So, how did you feel about coming into hospital? I can't put on a Glaswegian accent, so you'll have to excuse me. Um, it turns out that he wasn't really as nervous as he thought he would be. And he didn't feel very fatalistic, but he did know that the surgery had to be done, so he wasn't overtly troubled by coming into hospital. He felt the lead-up to his surgery was very professional and a good process from his diagnosis to treatment. There was a, national progr a natural progression through the system, and he was already familiar with the Western General Hospital, so he felt more comfortable with that. So what, if anything, were you worried about uh, the pre-op phase? Well, I don't like hospitals. And his mum sadly died aged 57, so he'd been used to being in and out of hospital as a young adult, so he was mildly phobic about that prospect. He wasn't worried about anything in particular, but he was very keen to get home, and he felt quite confident and in very good hands. However, the temperature was his main issue, and he found it unbearable. And that's, that's an interesting issue, isn't it? That we, we seldom think that patients can be so distressed about being cooked uh, in a hospital. And yet, every time we come to a conference, and certainly when I ever go to a conference in London, I just the experience of being cooked in a room uh, at you know, 90 degrees heat for two or three days with no windows open, it's, it's really an unpleasant experience. And this was this chap's main anxiety. Well, what, what was good about the pre-op information that you received? He felt the pre-op information was very well set out. Every stage of his procedure was explained well to him, and he couldn't think of any improvements that he'd uh, recommend, and he found it a positive experience. But no, nonetheless, we don't have videos, and we, you know, we, we, we feel certainly after being at this conference that we want more input in that pre-op experience. And so definitely. Uh -huh. But it's interesting that the, the patients don't perceive we, we think it's mm -hmm. inadequate, but they, they're I think we know because we've heard Dorothy Jacobson from Denmark talk about the forty five minutes to an hour consultation about purely enhanced recovery education. And in our uh, organization that's not possible. Mm -hmm. So we need to so think of roughly it. how long do patients get in our organization? I think they get between 45 minutes and an hour, but that's with a pre-admission nurse asking them about all types of um, issues with their health, talking about their uh, social history, their home circumstances. They have to go for ECG, they have to get their blood checked. So that consultation has a lot of information both given to and taken from the patients, and it's also to uh, deem them fit and safe for surgery. So this, say, we have a same-day admission policy, so it's not just quite as simple as you might think about this pre-admission 
uh, information set up because so much is happening to the patient at that time as well. You know, having CGs, going to x-rays, seeing anaesthetists, all sorts of things are happening. And you might think, well, this is a, a time that we can solely devote to an information phase, but it's not just quite like that. And that's why I feel that take home information from the clinic so they come to the pre-op uh, advice prepared and perhaps DVDs would be useful. And I think it's something that the society has to think about is the uniformity of the information that they provide to patients. Well, would written information be better than human contact? Would a DVD have been useful? What, what, what did he think? Well, he felt that written contact was good, but the human contact was very valuable. Um, he felt fairly vulnerable in the post-operative phase, so he added in that the contact with the enhanced recovery nurse was really important. And he felt that a DVD or a podcast or YouTube footage would be valuable, used in conjunction with the personal contact. That's right. So, you know, a, a manager's dream automation, no human contact needed, we can just put them down the factory line. I, I think that that uh, is not the case here. I think that we, we, we do need that personal input and uh, a well-educated nursing system to provide that uh, input is, is just so important. Interestingly, uh, talking with some of the uh, Canadian experience, uh, it would be fascinating to get the nurses from the ward to circulate through the pre-admission criteria providing that advice. And it's, but in our system, that, that's organisationally quite difficult. But I think this man's uh, response was quite key that he'd seen Angie before his operation and he then found the value of that human contact when he was suddenly this vulnerable patient in hospital. Okay. So were you worried about being discharged home early? No, Angie, I couldn't get out quick enough. So, I think that is something, you know, it, it, sometimes all people, patients don't want to go home quickly, but they've all heard about hospital acquired infections, and uh, who, want, who wouldn't want to get home quickly uh, from uh, the, the, the operation? Well, how was your interaction with your anaesthetist? Well, it was a good experience, he felt. Everyone was very professional, the information was good, there were no surprises regarding his anaesthetic, but he was a little shocked with the urinary catheter. And his anaesthetic experience he had no issues with. So you never, you never know what will happen to your willy when you come into hospital. <laughs> <laughs> and it's interesting, isn't that, isn't that funny? You, know, you, you think we would have covered that, uh, but uh, and here's this lawyer wakes up with something uh, where he didn't expect it uh, at all. Well, uh, this is a, a moment of pride. I'll just stand back here, make sure that everyone reads these slides. <laughs> How was your interaction with your surgeon? Oh, he it had, was he, awesome. He had no issues, I can't tell you. 11 out of 10 for <laughs> surgery, 11 out of 10 for his aftercare. Yes, and I only paid him a thousand pounds. <laughs> So, um, were you prepared appropriately for your post-operative care? Yes, he felt he was very well informed. There were no real surprises, with the exception of the catheter, which is diff different in reality than it is in theory. Mm. So, you know, within our system, we, we do seem as a, as a quality control issue to be able to provide adequate information as far as the patient is concerned. And I think that that just shows you this importance of talking to patients, patient experiences of uh, enhanced recovery. If you don't ask the patients, if you, uh, just out of interest, how many in the room have actually had patient specific patient feedback about the quality of their programme? Hands up. A, a few hands, but not, not everyone. And you know, th th this is where you need to be, because how are you going to know What's well, good if, if, if you don't get this kind of feedback. So I, I do really believe, I'm, being a surgeon, I think this is all kind of touchy, feely rubbish. But uh, <laughs> yeah, you, ha you have to take that surgical gown off 
and you have to be realistic about patient centered activity when it comes to EMFs. Okay, ward experience. Now th this is this is where it gets a bit more uh, interesting. Negative. Uh -huh. Interesting. <laughs> he, how, how did you find out? How did you experience the ward? Well, he um, felt that he, he was initially initially managed in a side room, which he found was uh, very good, and then uh, for logistic reasons, he was moved to a shared five bedded area on his fourth day post op. He became incredibly hot and claustrophobic and ended up having a bit of a panic attack during the night and wished to leave hospital. So as a stark contrast, he scores his uh, ward experience as a 1 out of 10 in relation to this uh, event. Um, but he was keen to point out that um, when we got some, everything so right, that it was very obvious when we got it wrong. So it stood out even more for him. And he further mentioned that there was a disconnect between the tremendous surgical care to being bumped to a ward area. He felt the single room experience was excellent. And we find this a lot when you've got a high dependency patient being moved to the main ward and they have this separation anxiety almost. He then commented that it went from the sublime to the ridiculous to go from his excellent care to feeling abandoned in one of the same hospital experiences. So he's now a little phobic about coming back in, understandably. It was not a reflection on the nursing care, it was the heat and the noise, and the nurses were great, but he expressed that he felt they were very busy. So different patients respond to different environments, and this man appreciated his privacy when he was initially nursed within a, a single room, but in the NHS we uh, have to move patients around as the patient flux changes from day to day, and he moved into a shared room with uh, other patients. And obviously he found that really a distressing issue. He was uh, used to his privacy. He found this kind of more public recovery much more difficult to cope with. He found the uh, talking to nurses, asking for care uh, in that environment much more difficult. And he also found, the, 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 again, the heat and the busyness uh, of a room where other patients were receiving care at the same time, he found that really quite uh, distressing. So this is something that he didn't mention to me at all. I had no idea that this was going on uh, during his experience. It was only when Angie did this interview that all this spilled out. So, did you find a pain or problem during your stay? Um, no, he was given a morphine PCA, uh, which worked well. Again, he was a planned laparoscopic procedure, so we wouldn't have put an epidural in him. Um, he went home uh, on day five with tramadol, which he stopped very quickly when he was home, just as a personal principle that he didn't wish to remain on. He was surprised at just how much pain he was in at times, but the hospital staff did their utmost to reduce that pain. So here you again, you see the best laid plans of mice and men and the laparoscopic procedure. We heard of the debate this morning, local regional blocks would be optimal. Uh, this chap uh, ended up with a, a small but significant transverse abdominal wound and uh, he had a morphine PCA to uh, get him through that. And it's interesting, this business of do you prepare patients to experience some pain, and but so long as they can uh, mobilise, they're not too distressed, then that's okay. Or do you aim for no pain? Because I think that, for example, when you think about epidural service, when you aim for no pain, that's when you run into difficulties with achieving that without side effects from hypotension or, or other problems. So, um, what about mobilisation? I found it difficult to get in and out of bed. Um, he's a very robust gentleman and between the ages of 21 and 55 he's had very few days off work so he found it very difficult to be an invalid. It was a big shock, he was fatigued which was surprising to him and psychologically difficult for him but he did state that he remembers me dragging him up and down the corridor which was quite nice. So we were doing our job, we were getting him mobilised but it, it was an uphill experience, certainly as far as that part was concerned. Did you enjoy the food? Well, I didn't expect to enjoy the food anyway. 
He didn't expect to have an interest in the food. He was advised to eat a sloppy diet, which was a little contrary to what he uh, was offered. The supplement drinks um, were okay, but not the ideal. Um, the pre-op carbohydrate loading concept did make sense to him, so he recommended that. Uh, but he did state that there was no preparing him for the laxatives. He did feel like he was in an episode of Alien. <laughs> well, that's when his bowels finally moved. <laughs> okay. Uh, was your patient diary so it says, so as you know we recommend the patient keep a diary and this idea that they say, you know, my catheter's due out today, what about this doc, what about that? Well he admitted that he didn't really use it properly and that he filled it in retrospectively, but he did think it was a good concept, so to keep it in the programme. <laughs> is that interesting there he is filling it out, you know, well what we're done today, rather than using it as a, a kind of target thing. Was the ERS nurse helpful? Well, this is quite embarrassing to ask a patient about how did you like me, but um, he found it remarkably helpful to meet the same person over and over again. The concept of the enhanced recovery nurse was very valuable. I was a nice and interesting person, I'm not sure how to take that. <laughs> Friendly and in control and nice but firm. And yeah, um, he, he did feel that he knew me and felt confident. So th this is a great debate and I think it could be a subject of a debate in a future conference is that uh, do you have specific individuals that are working within the team to motivate the patients and the team to get the highest possible compliance with the ERAS protocol, or do you feel that you embed so completely the pathway within the overall team that you no longer need somebody to drive the system along? I think this will depend upon uh, natural circumstances but uh, within our uh, position, uh, we certainly need somebody like Angie to meet with 10 surgeons and all the nurses uh, and try and behave and follow the pathway. Were you anxious about your discharge? How was it when you got home? I couldn't get home quick enough. Again, he did imply that twice. Or imply twice. He was well cared for at home. He had a wife, children, friends. He had a good sense of relief when he got home, but he did still have problems with that claustrophobia and it did stay behind for about two to three weeks before it wore off. He was asking his wife to open windows and doors just to make him feel better. So again, there's something you completely miss uh, until you ask the patient about their experience. Well, you're reassured by the follow-up call that I think there's a real quality issue uh, for an ERAS programme. You can't go for early discharge and just abandon the patient in the community. He found it very, very helpful. Um, the phone calls and email contacts make you feel like the system hasn't just churned you out and that someone genuinely cares about your recovery. Well, what was the most difficult part of getting better? He was very frustrated. He wanted to get back to normal as quickly as possible. In fact, this gentleman did go back to work particularly early. He saw his occupational health team six weeks post-op and then had a phased return to work. And before that, he was working from home. And what was the easiest aspect of your recovery? Well, none, none of it was easy. But I feel I made a rapid recovery and got all the support I needed. Yeah. So it's, it's not easy. And when you talk to your friends that have actually had major surgery, uh, this uh, home recovery phase, it's just not Mickey Mouse. And it's, this is, I think, one of the real challenges for enhanced recovery is looking more into the detail of this recovery process because we know so little about what goes on once the patient goes home. Well, what, if anything, would you change about your recovery? Again, he's not quick to criticise, so he started off by saying the process was great, there was no lack of coordination, the role of the GP was very positive, but, and this was a personal criticism, he should have taken more time off and he wished that he'd chilled out a bit more. So there you are, we all, you know, when lab colleagues come in, we said, well, you know, I'll take the same uh, eight weeks off work, and now we're saying, well, have a day case lab colleague and get back to work the next day. But maybe the fatigue and these other elements that come into recovery from surgery, we have to have a more graded approach to the uh, reintroduction to work. Well, when did you feel fully recovered? Again, because he's quite an articulate chap, he broke it down quite significantly. So <laughs> the, the quick answer is eight weeks, but um, you can see there that he had his surgery on the 16th of April and between that and to the 25th of June, he saw various people. He started working part-time in the end of May, started walking the dogs in uh, 
June and then had a holiday in Orkney, which he did feel almost fully recovered, but full-time work commenced on the 25th of June. So two months, that's the recovery time. Any other comments? Well, again, embarrassingly, he thought the ERAS nurse was one of the main benefits of the ERAS programme. He had no reference points, he'd never been in hospital before, so he had nothing to uh, refer to, but he found it all very good. However, now he feels the process is a bit of a blur, apart from the seven centimetre scar that he sees every morning when buttoning up his shirt. So that, that's our patient experience, thank you very much.